And I'm particularly uh, happy to uh, be here in a series that is honoring uh, my mentor, uh, John Seely Brown, who's been a huge influence in my intellectual uh, and professional development over actually many decades uh, in ways that will become clearer uh, in my talk. Uh, but I wanted to start with a story that's really um, a bit of an entry into this long-term influence that John has had on my work. Uh, when I was a graduate student at Stanford, I would hang out at Xerox Park during the reign of JSB. And uh, I was working with a group who was doing research and development around uh, those text-based online worlds that were big in the early 90s, MUDs, MOOs. Sounds a lot like MOOCs, but they're not MOOCs. Uh, <laughs> uh, but they were the equivalent of their time in a lot of ways. And, I remember talking to one of my teammates and I was, you know, I've always been interested in kids and gaming and play and I was like, isn't it going to be cool when games get really networked on the internet? And then he looks at me, not critically, but just puzzled and says, wait, isn't the internet for work? <laughs> And then I keep remembering that, not because I thought my colleague was short-sighted or critical, but because it was a reminder of the ways in which we all inhabit our own particular social and cultural milieu, where we have our own investments, our own identities, and the same technology, the same technology affordances can look like a very different opportunity space, depending on who you hang out with, who your investment, where your investments are, uh, and what you see as the potential of the technology. Now, as I said, I've had the great pri privilege of coming of age intellectually and as a researcher within the context of institutions that JSB has built. This has included Xerox PARC and a particular orient orientation to social and technical research that was developed during a period that I was able to spend there. Uh, it includes the Institute for Research on Learning, uh, where I did my dissertation work. Uh, it also includes the MacArthur Foundation's Dig Digital Media and Learning Initiative, which JSB was instrumental in kicking off as a board member and continues to advise. Um, I keep coming back to the book that John, JSB and Paul Duguid published in 2000, which really captured an insight that maybe a lot of us in this room take for granted now, because many of us work at the intersection of society and technology. But really this idea about the inseparability of society and technology, and the fact that the human dimension and the context institutions, structures, forms of differentiation that are pre-existing in our society and culture shape technology in particular ways and that it's really important to attend to those uh, ways in which uh, technology and society are deeply intertwingled. Um, you know, this is the insight that continues to animate uh, a lot of good research, a lot of new interdisciplinary fields like you have represented here, whether it's information science or human computer interaction or science and technology studies. But I think what's important about John's work is not only the thought leadership, the crisp conceptual definition of the work, but also the fact that it's not just about the ideas, but about how you try to put those ideas in practice. So John is not only a thinker, but a technology maker not only an interdisciplinary intellectual, but somebody who builds practices and institutions and who crosses boundaries. I know John jokingly calls himself a bumblebee or chief of confusion, but one of the things that I have aspired to, not necessarily as successfully as John, is to be able to not only talk about the intermingling of these diverse spheres, but to actually cross them, bring them together, to dry, try to build institutions that embody that hybridity within the practice. And I think that's actually something that's happening extraordinarily well here. Uh, so I would like to take the opportunity of today's talk to talk a little bit about my own experiences and struggles in following in the footsteps of JSB in some small way. Um, and actually, the enormous challenge we face in putting this very crisp, 
conceptual framework into practice. So we can say, oh look, society and technology are mutually constitutive, our institutions shape the form technologies take, but what do you do to build on those insights and to start moving the conversation forward in ways that are really uh, building off the values, um, progressive values that we might care to instantiate and the positive social values that we hope technology will embody for us. So I'd like to do this first by uh, framing a little bit of what I see as the problem space, some of the broader public debates around technology, education, and learning where I situate most of my work, uh, talk a little bit about the research and research findings and how that plays into those conversations, and then end by talking about the work that we've been doing as part of the MacArthur DML initiative in trying to bridge research and practice in order to uh, you know, do this work of building new kinds of social and institutional formations. <clears throat> okay, so what's out there in the world? Uh, as some of these conversations, you've probably seen within the media, uh, you know, varying degrees of interest in questions about kids, about learning, about new technology, often young people at the forefront of these anxieties we have about how new technology is affecting society. So is Facebook making us lonely? Is Google making us stupid? Uh, now, there may be more proponents than detractors in this room. I'm not sure. I'm just making assumptions. But of course, the same happens in the uh, other side of the ledger, so not only is technology making us dumber, distracted, and lonely, it's also making us smarter, more democratic, more entrepreneurial, and a lot of good things, too. And this is um, a, a very familiar dynamic um, of polarization in the debates when a new technology is introduced, and I find that when young people get inserted into that conversation, and when it starts intersecting with some deeply held values in our society around things like learning and literacy, there is a tendency for it to get polarized even more. And so this is certainly not new to social media, not new to digital culture, but is something that has accompanied the introduction of every new technology that young people have adopted in large numbers, whether it's the television, the PC, the multimedia CD-ROM, and I think, um, to some extent, we could get discouraged by this, but I think there's also an opportunity to some, uh, for some of us to help or think of trying to break this pattern. I mean, the, the problem with this is, is Google making us stupid? Is Facebook making us lonely? We're ascribing agency to technology, which gives us an opening to abdicate our own responsibility for shaping the uses of these technologies. So rhetorically, not only does it not leave an opening for intervention other than do you use it or not use it, right? Is it good or bad? Does it have a place in the classroom or does it not? But it also ignores the tremendous diversity of ways in which people take up technology and the fact that technology has uneven effects depending on the social lo location, uh, the stratification, the institutional context. It's like uh, Bill Gibson famously said, the future is here, it's just unevenly distributed. And a lot of these arguments ignore uh, the diversity of experience because of the assumption uh, underlying the discourse that technology has uh, uniform effects. So, as JSB often says, the, the important thing is to ask the right questions, and the right question is not, is technology good or bad or learning, good, good or bad for learning, but really the question that I would like to ask is under what conditions, in what cultural contexts, what institutional configurations when does technology have positive outcomes, negative outcomes, and specifically for whom? So the question then is what happens when new technology intersects with stratification, inequity, and the institutions, like our educational system, unfortunately, that produces inequity? Now for all of you who work in education, these kinds of numbers are not anything uh, new. Uh, so high school dropout rates in this country have hovered at about 30 percent for a while uh, for black, Latino, and Native American youth. Uh, 
that number is about 50%. Now, of course, there's tons of indicators of edu uh, educational stratification, so it's not that I intend to privilege this one in particular, but um, I think that when we talk about new technology without beginning first with stratification, um, when we're dealing with something like an entrenched institution like education, then it becomes very difficult to uh, get concrete and specific about the right kinds of designs and interventions. Um, and otherwise, the technology just becomes another technique that gets mobilized more effectively by privileged kids. So part of uh, what I think is important in framing the conversation, the questions, is to look at educational um, privilege uh, in terms of, in some ways, the existing institutions that stratify and sort and divide kids, uh, but also to start considering how the technology may start changing those dynamics of privilege and access in new ways. So um, my feeling is that more and more we're entering an era, and this is something John talks and uh, Doug talk about in their New Culture of Learning book, is we're entering an era when the kind of learning that really starts to matter is not just the getting good grades, going to a good school, like college completion matters more than ever in traditional outcomes, but there's also this need for a more entrepreneurial, self-directed learner who really understands how to make use of the informal learning opportunities, the demand-driven ecosystem of information. Um, and that's what we're really finding in highly successful, what is sometimes called creative class kind of youth and careers, that there's this new learning dynamic that's emerging that isn't just about the formal achievement, but is about what I suspect many of us in this room do when we want to learn something new, which isn't necessarily to go take a class, but to go online, to connect to other people who have expertise, to understand an ecosystem and a flow of information um, and expertise in social relationships that enables us to learn something new that's demand-driven rather than uh, the, the banking model of education that Freire has, uh, has uh, critiqued so effectively. So I want to take a quick body poll, uh, uh, take the temperature of those of you in this room, just in terms of your own feelings about uh, you know, the possibilities of uh, how internet is changing learning and research. So if you could show me with your thumbs, where thumbs up is, it's totally, like the online world, digital, social media has completely transformed the way I learn, access information, and do research where thumbs down is like, it's actually made things worse. I'm distracted, I can't find anything, I'm overwhelmed with information. It's really just a negative effect on my learning and research, where sideways is some good and some bad, um, definitely good things about it, but I really miss you know, going to paper books and you know, other forms of learning and reflection that I think are, are more valuable. So where would you put yourself? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so generally positive, but a lot, a lot of sideways. So that's interesting, not so many thumbs down. Um, so I think what we have in this room is the new learning elite, right? So I think it's important to start thinking about educational and learning privilege as a hybrid that includes those traditional markers of privilege, but also is about the kind of uh, sort of what John has called the entrepreneurial learning that is happening in these highly tech leveraged ways. Um, the, the problem here though is that that kind of learning, that informal demand driven learning, is not something that our public institutions of education are performing an equalizing function for. And this is where the equity thing starts becoming really, really important. So most of you have probably been aware of things like dropout rates. This is the kind of number that gets less play in the public discourse about learning and education because people tend not to look at the informal and out of school space. So in the period since the 70s, if you look at expenditures on enrichment activities, so the after school clubs, the violin lessons, whatever, it's tripled from 3,500 to um, 
almost $9,000 per household in the upper quintile in this country. And for the lower quintile, it's basically stayed flat. So in an era when you see contracting opportunity for good jobs, heightened competition for traditional educational achievement, privileged families are going out of school to fuel uh, their learning and achievement edge. And the big fear I have is that the opportunities that are abundant and wonderful and accessible in terms of the digital and network learning are going to create an even wider wedge between those families who have the social and cultural capital to support those kinds of customized, individualized, empowered forms of learning and those who are largely dependent on our public infrastructures and aren't embedded in those networks of high-tech social and cultural capital that can fuel the most um, amazing kinds of learning opportunity that the online uh, world uh, can really offer for young people. Um, so this is where I've been a strong advocate for looking at learning holistically from a learner-centered perspective and the ecology of learning rather than looking simply at our traditional metrics of success. Now what's interesting about our current historical moment is that we're seeing a growing equity gap in terms of opportunity, whether that's educational or economic opportunity in this country, at the same time that we're, we're, we've really seen a closing of what we've co traditionally considered the digital divide. So back you know, in the Xerox PARC days, uh, the digital divide, when I was at Xerox PARC, I don't mean to say that um, it's past, but when I was in graduate school at Xerox PARC, there was a lot of talk about the digital divide, uh, last mile for you know, access to the internet and things like that. And those, uh, there are still pockets where um, basic access is still problematic, but we've seen a real closing of a lot of those gaps. And teenagers have really led the adoption of um, you know, a lot of what we think of as sophisticated Web 2.0 social media-like uses. Um, you know, older generations have started to catch up uh, and, you know, gaming is obviously a, a gateway into a lot of digital and network practices, which are act, was, it should, is actually a lot more class and privilege agnostic than a lot of other technology forms. Uh, yeah, so virtually all teenagers play games, are on social media of some kind, and then um, finally even in this country, text messaging. When I moved back to the U.S. from Japan in the late 90s, I was thinking, I don't know, are American teenagers ever going to start text messaging? Because the US was 10 years behind uh, Korea, Japan, and Northern Europe at that point. And then the switch flipped. And we, these are sort of the numbers that are kind of the stabilized numbers for the teen demographic for most post-industrial countries. 50 texts a day for boys, 100 texts a day for girls, something al along those lines. So these <clears throat> technologies have become basic infrastructure of social communication for teenagers these days, even at the same time that their uses for learning and education are still highly uh, um, diverse or stratified. So what we're finding today, our current situation, is that young people are highly engaged in social and recreational uses of new media. They have a lot of interests, they care about their peers, but there's a big engagement gap between where kids are and the kinds of opportunities that technology can offer in opening up doors to opportunity in their future adult lives, whether that's academic achievement, civic and political engagement, or economic opportunity. And there is still a big gap, a generational gap, and a gap in our institutions, particularly our public serving institutions, in order to mediate that gap. Now, my problem with the concern about individual outcomes, whether that's distractibility or uh, loneliness, is not that those things aren't important, but they detract attention from what I think is the more pressing problem and set of questions we need to be asking for, that the more pressing set of risks, which is the risk of a profound and growing equity gap between uh, those with educational privilege and those without. And this rarely makes it into the public conversation around technology and education. Now, <clears throat> what do we do about it as researchers, technology makers, um, progressive educators? <clears throat> 
So just to rewind a little bit to some of the work um, that Jeff mentioned that came out of the first round of funding of the then nascent Digital Media and Learning Initiative that MacArthur funded. Uh, so um, as Jeff mentioned, uh, together with uh, Peter Lyman and Michael Carter, um, I co-led a study with, uh, involving a large group of researchers that was really starting with uh, the basic question, so what are kids doing these days with new technology, specifically digital games, uh, social media, and digital media production tools, and how does that reflect their learning? And uh, specifically, we went to out-of-school contexts, uh, social and recreational uses of new media, because it was our intu intuition and continues to be so today that that is the site of greater engagement and innovation than what we were necessarily seeing in the formal <laughs> educational sector. Um, hopefully, that's been changing rapidly. Uh, but uh, you know, it was it was and is still fairly unusual for educational research to be doing major studies of learning in the out-of-school sector. So this was um, a fairly bold move on the part of the foundation in a lot of ways, and I think was empowered by John uh, being part of the formulation of this new initiative. So what did we find? I won't go into all the findings, but um, the biggest goal of the work was really to start looking at the diversity of ways in which learning engagement was being impacted by the influx of these, these new technologies and young people's everyday lives. And it's very rare to have the opportunity to conduct a whole range of ethnographic cases with different populations and then look at them across settings. So as ethnographers, we're usually trained to go into context solo, do deep analysis, and then you know, maybe talk to our colleagues, but not really do analysis across them. And so what we did was a lot of the hard work of you know, arguing with each other about what we were seeing, how my kids were different from Dana's kids, were different from what Sarita was looking at. And so we had these great conversations about not just the depth we had in our individual cases, but how these kids were positioned in relation to each other. So I do the geeky kids, Dana does the popular kids. You know, we kind of argue about who's right about certain trends. And this is what helped us arrive at these categories um, which we call genres of participation that differentiated how different kids, depending on their social and cultural locations, took up technologies in different ways. And there's a lot of distinctions we came up with, but the main one uh, has really been the distinction between uh, friendship-driven and interest-driven learning and participation, where friendship-driven participation is really about those mainstream sorts of peer social behaviors that you see that is ubiquitous in teen culture that center around popularity status, uh, flirting, uh, looking good to your peers, and that is replicating a lot of the dynamics in the lunchroom, the locker room, um, at school. And when we were doing our research, it was MySpace and uh, Live, uh, MySpace and IM, and now it's Facebook and text messaging. So the platforms change, but the behaviors are incredibly resilient, and we're really a replication of these teen pressure cookers that we set up when we put young people in age-segregated contexts. Uh, and so this is uh, a site where we saw a lot of incredibly important learning dynamics around what it means to get together, uh, get along with your friends, to engage with your peers in public and semi-public spaces, to not irritate each other, to get a date. I mean, these are all really incredibly important things socially and developmentally. And along the way, because technology has become a ubiquitous part of these teen dynamics, they pick up how to create a homepage, how to mess around with HTML, how to modify digital media, how to publicize things on the internet, becomes just part of what we used to consider sophisticated technical skills, just is part of the ether of peer culture. And so it's important not to underestimate the importance of that form of learning that happens within these peer contexts. Now, a lot of my own work, though, uh, has really focused on the learning opportunity on the interest-driven side. So these are the behaviors that are really centered around young people pursuing an intellectual or creative or athletic interest that they have that is fairly specialized, 
uh, that isn't about popularity status and those kinds of things, but is about getting really good at something, geeking out with your friends. Um, often, not always, these are the kids who are at the margins of teen social status, so they're the uh, freaks, geeks, dorks, creative kids. Uh, you know, I'm sure some of us in this room have had these identity formations ourselves growing up. Uh, but often what happens is the local peer group who you get thrown into just by virtue of proximity and age isn't necessarily the peer group who you would intentionally choose based on identity and interest. And this is why specialized identities and interests often become marginalized unless you go to a school that's specialized or that's uh, defined as more of an intentional learning community rather than a given community. And there's obviously schools with different dynamics, but overall, um, the peer dynamics in a school tend not to be highly supportive of expertise-driven identities unless you happen to be really into football or cheerleading or something that has really high status in your peer culture or school. Now, these distinctions play on in online platforms. So when we were doing our research, it was MySpace for friendship, it was uh, LiveJournal for interest, today it is Facebook for friendship, and uh, Tumblr for interests. Now, of course, interests-based platforms are highly diverse. They're specialized to the interests, but uh, you know, the, again, it's like the underlying social dynamics, cultural distinctions, incredibly resilient, even as the technology, the platforms that are popular change pretty rapidly. Um, you know, and what's interesting about the online world and where we see the opportunity for interest-driven learning is that the online world changes the opportunity space in the interest-driven world in really fundamental ways, in ways that it doesn't change the friendship world quite so profoundly. So we saw this in early online communities that dealt with specialized identities, whether it was LGBT youth or it was youth with specialized interests, geeky youth that the internet became a lifeline to connecting with youth, interests, and identities that you may not have had a critical mass within your local community. Now, this dynamic is scaling massively so that we have the opportunity suddenly for, to be able to connect with people regardless of whether we have those relationships available to us locally. Uh, and this is where the online world has the potential to make a tremendous difference to young people. Um, and often in our work, we did find cases of kids who you know, were managing all those peer dynamics within their local environment, but were also on World of Warcraft and was guild leaders on World of Warcraft, though none of their peers at school knew about it, were a you know, football player who was secretly playing Sims on the side, and all, a lot of things were going on so that young people could start segmenting and being selective about their identity formations. So just to make it a little bit more concrete, I wanted to share a story about one young man I interviewed as part of uh, our digital use study. He was part of my anime fan case study. But he was a web comics creator, and he discovered web comics in the summer after his freshman year in college. He was at a rural, small college. All of his friends had gone away. He got online. He discovered a web comic that he loved and just read everything he could. He went, he was like, okay, I'm gonna do this. So he checked out web making for dummies, um, went on, took a lot of online tutorials and started making web pages and web comics. So the open ecosystem of the internet that has a lot of help forms, a lot of technical knowledge, was his entry point in being able to mess around with a new interest, a new technology, and gain exposure. Now, the thing that really fueled his learning into expertise, though, was the fact that he started connecting with other web comics creators on the internet, really finding a community online that supported his interests, his identity development. Eventually, he started hosting web comics and creating a site that aggregated web comics uh, for other artists. Uh, you can see he has advertising and was eventually making enough money from his site to support the site. And he actually started um, after school, after he graduated from school, uh, making a living as a web developer. And he said that. You know, along the way, he tried changing majors. 
several times to accommodate his interests, but none of his course offerings in school were actually preparing him for what he wanted to do, which was this. But he said, I really valued college because it was four years that I could just devote to learning web comics, which I learned on my own and with my community. And uh, so when I interviewed him, he was making a living as a web developer. By the time the book was published, he was actually making his living full time on web comics by selling merchandise related to his work. So he's an interesting case of a self-directed learner uh, you know, who was able to take that opportunity, that space of what you think of as your time in higher education to make a school to career transition, but did it in a very self-directed way that made use of not only the content resource, but also the community resources on the internet. And so when you look at Dave's uh, learning ecosystem, he started with a passionate interest that he discovered because of the internet, but then the way that he was able to get good at it was he took to the internet to develop a set of peer relationships that centered on his interests. Now he still hung out with his friends at college, so it wasn't as if he was socially isolated locally, but he had a new community that was highly tar targeted and specialized in what he was interested in. And what was interesting about Snafu Dave that made him different from almost every other young person we interviewed, although there were a handful of cases like him, is that he was able to connect the learning he was doing in the informal space, in the peer, social, and the interest-driven space, and make it relevant, not directly for his academic achievement, but certainly for economic opportunity. And it's very, very rare that kids are able to close that loop. Right? This is difficult because our institutions don't actually support the connections. Uh, but this is where we see the real opportunity space. So can we start thinking about drawing the connections between these sp spheres of learning now that we're seeing an explosion of opportunity in the interest and peer-driven space? And what would it take to start supporting the kind of learning that a highly activated and resourceful learner like Snafu Dave was achieving? And so we saw a few cases of kids who are really passionate, who are really resourceful, who are able to pull this all together. Most kids aren't like that. Most people aren't like that. We tend to require a little bit more supports, a few more invitations, institutional warrants in order to be able to build connections like this. And so the moral of the story is not that the internet creates kids like Snafu Dave, it's that it won't without much more principled, uh, well-directed kinds of educational interventions that really look at the opportunity space in new media in a way that is much more ecological and that attends to the whole learning ecosystem rather than um, starting only from this sphere of formal education. So uh, in the aftermath of the digital use study, um, by the time we finished, the Digital Media and Learning Initiative had become the centerpiece of MacArthur's funding in education. And we've had the great benefit of having a really interesting coalition of researchers and practitioners that we've been working in to build on some of the exploratory findings that came out of our work, uh, the work of Henry Jenkins in looking at new media literacies as some of the first uh, kinds of efforts out of the gate. Uh, we're involved in uh, sort of in the middle of a new round of empirical work that's looking not just at what young people are doing today already and they're out in the wilds of the internet, but saying how do you uh, take that learning and engagement and make it consequential for civic and political engagement, which is the goal of the Youth and Participatory Politics Research Network, and for academic outcomes, which is the focus of the Connected Learning Research Network that I lead. Um, <coughs> Now, a big question is, you know, given that we're doing research on how these dynamics work in online environments, uh, the distribution and equity issues in, in relation to opportunity, what is the role that technology can make? And we get asked this all the time, right? Does connected learning require technology? Uh, can technology make a difference? And I've just, I started by making an argument against technological determinism, but it's also really important to recognize and be smart about what it actually does help us do um, in terms of social change. And I think it's an interesting moment right now because suddenly the conversation 
around technology and education is really uh, center stage um, in a way that it hasn't been for a long time because of these MOOCs and new experiments in the online space. Uh, and I think uh, there's a, both an opportunity and risk inherent in existing incumbent institutions taking a very large interest in these kinds of opportunities for online content and learning. So I'm sort of curious, could I get a show of hands of how many people have taken an online course, not necessarily a MOOC, but any kind of online course? Wow, that's a lot of people. Wow, okay. Um, so how, okay, let's do another, since so many of you have, but for everybody, not just even if you've taken a course or not, how positive or negative do you feel about online courses in making a positive difference to education? Up or down? Oh, interesting. Okay, the room is really divided on this one. Huh. Well, that's a, it's a good indicator that there's openness in the conversation. <laughs> um, so we're really early in this conversation, right? So this is, you know, this is the community who needs to be engaged in it. So, um, and there's a lot of attention. So, you know, it, it's one of the um, problems and opportunities we've been handed. Now, the MOOC thing isn't new, right? There's been online lessons and lectures for quite a while on the internet. It's just the big difference is that uh, it's Stanford and University of Michigan. It, you know, the, the, there's a big difference when the institutional actors uh, get into this. Now, I think what's interesting for me as somebody who's been sort of agitating at the margins of this kind of stuff for a while is not only just how the conversation changes when the you know, big boys enter the room, but also the focus on content delivery, right? Which is incredibly important, right? Like, what's not to love about free and open learning content on the internet that's accessible um, and, uh, you know, that is often uh, coming from elite institutions and really, really respected professionals in the field? Um, on the other hand, it's interesting how much more attention gets paid when the model replicates what people are familiar with in education. So I think the idea of lectures being online is something that is easy for people to understand, is easy for people to deliver, is an absolutely essential part of the online ecosystem, but is just one part of the ecosystem. So that's the risk, right? You don't want the silver bullet approach by thinking if you push content down pipes, learning will happen but you need the content down pipes, so you certainly don't want to discourage that from happening. Now, Khan Academy is obviously the other site that's getting a lot of attention in this space in addition to the MOOCs. Um, again, what's not to love about uh, free content and this uh, guy who's really motivated by a spirit of public service, uh, which has been really, really impressive. I think since Khan Academy launched, the tech sector has really jumped on it as a solution to the problems in education. I think educators haven't been quite as enthusiastic, um, especially math teachers. Um, and they have rightly pointed out in a way that Khan himself has been very open to critique about, that it's not just content expertise, but it's actually pedagogical expertise that matters as well. And so a, a couple math teachers did a mystery science theater type video critique of one of Khan's lessons. Uh, that got taken up quite a lot. Um, he actually changed his lessons based on the critique, but then a group of ed bloggers sponsored a video contest, a teacher video contest to do critiques of Khan's videos. And sort of the takeaway of one of the ed bloggers, Justin Reich, was that we were promised jetpacks and we got lectures, uh, which is a really good reminder of how early we are in the innovation cycle on this, and is certainly not to me meant to be a discouragement. But I think it's just a reminder that we have a lot of pieces to put together um, and that just putting content out there uh, is, not, uh, is a starting point, but not the ultimate answer necessarily. Now, the other opportunity spaces around technology, social media, network media, and learning that I think get much less attention but deserve so much more attention are um, two aspects. One, 
is self-expression, right? So we know that digital technologies have radically reduced the cost and accessibility of creating media stuff, content, and sharing it online. This is a learning space, right? So it's not just a sharey space, it's a learning space. And this is the piece that it's harder because it's not standardized content, we're not in control of it. But this is the kind of stuff that I've been really interested in studying when looking at kids' um, organic interest communities. And you're seeing platforms like Instructables that is really optimized for this kind of peer learning uh, and sharing. Uh, now, a lot of this stuff happens organically in online interest groups, um, but there are groups like Peer-to-Peer -peer University who are explicitly designing for peer learning kinds of dynamics in different areas of interest. Um, and then an, a, a, a genre of platform that I think doesn't get enough love and attention among educators is Q&A forums, which are just amazing. Like, isn't it amazing that now you can just go on the internet, ask a question, and somebody will answer it? It's, it's amazing. And why don't we wake up every morning and just be amazed by that? Um, and so, like Stack Overflow, which started as a geek Q&A site, has syndicated to all kinds of interest, including English language and usage. So every like, form of geekdom, has its online forum. And there are people who are really good at these things on the internet who give their expertise for free. And this is the kind of scalable capacity building that is a really sort of underappreciated resource in the technology and education conversations. And if we could connect those up to some of these bigger, more formal kinds of educational pl platforms, uh, in ways that are not institution specific, but are about open, about capacity building. I think we have a ton of potential. Um, the other piece is um, the diversification of interests that happens when you are um, looking at open and social. So it's not just that you have um, you know, the opportunity for individuals to share um, and create, but the fact that you're, you can proliferate niche communities and they can get more specialized, and suddenly you have an opportunity to reach diverse young people where they are. And it's not just like Stack Overflow started with the geeky coder communities, um, you know, white male geeky, you know, the traditional internet communities, but the internet's not just for geeks anymore. And so one of the case studies we've been looking at is Ravelry.com, which is a fiber arts community where kids learn to do really hard things, like making a knitting pattern is really, really hard. And they're just an amazing uh, community that is sort of breaking some of the stereotypes of what an online interest group uh, is like. Now, of course, we're looking at gaming and other forms of traditional geek interests as well. But um, you know, we're still seeing, I mean, there's still a divide here where when we've pulled for interest, trying to find online groups that are instantiating a lot of these peer learning principles, they're still skewing towards sort of geeky, male, you know, fairly privileged groups, and often groups and interests and identities that are more oriented towards non-dominant youth have less play, uh, girls' interests have less play, but we are in a space where there, it's opening up the possibility of even uh, non-dominant or tech-centered interests having more of a um, play in the space, and it's really about, again, diversifying pathways, growing capacity instead of this uh, bottleneck, winner-take-all, narrow pathway approach to uh, what the online world can offer for learning. Okay, so to return to uh, the connected learning model that I introduced with Snafu Dave, uh, this idea of the three spheres of learning, it's not descriptive, just a descriptive model, but it really is uh, trying to sketch out the beginning of an approach to policy, technology deployment, partnership program design, a strategy that is cross-sector, um, which makes it incredibly exciting, but also incredibly difficult, because it forces us to do what JSB has done in his career, is cross the public and private sectors, to cross institutional boundaries. We are working, like I don't know any other initiative that is working with um, the Institute for Museum of Library Services, Lady Gaga, and Team Liquid of StarCraft. You know, it's like 
This is, it's about coalition building and finding the points of shared purpose across these sectors that don't traditionally work together, they, that may not always see themselves as educational entities. A lot of the tech sector, like I don't know that Google thinks of themselves as an educational education business, but they are in the business of education. They have the platform where more learning happens every day um, than anywhere else in a lot of ways. Uh, so it is a uniquely powerful approach, we believe, but also uh, very difficult to put into practice. Um, it's really about broadening the partnerships, the access points and pathways uh, so that young people from diverse walks of life, diverse interests can have not only entry points but ways of deepening um, and finding more social supports for their interests. So it's not just the math geek or the football star who has that experience of really having their identity and interests and learning supported, but um, kids with a much diverse, more diverse range. And so in our work, um, we really, with Connected Learning, we really try to start with the values first, because otherwise technology and educational techniques become techniques that become deployed first for privileged communities and lastly for less privileged and become a greater wedge. We know historically that's what happens with new technology, new educational affordances, is that far, even though it, it's not about intentionality, even if the intentionality of the innovators, the educators, is to create greater equity, if they become techniques that are divorced from a social values perspective, they don't really address some of the broader social equity issues that a lot of us are concerned about. At the same time, we are trying to drill down into the design principles and technique layers. So what does it really look like when you have a high functioning connected learning environment? We're still really early in this work and we're really trying to develop cases, examples, design experiments. Um, if you look at our site, connectedlearning.tv, we're starting to curate some of these cases. We'd love to have more examples. We'd love to, we're trying to initiate a conversation about whether the model is right, what are examples of it, what are the challenges. Um, you know, one of the first sort of flagship examples we have is the UMedia site, uh, where in uh, the main downtown library in Chicago, uh, the library gave uh, the MacArthur Foundation and Pearson an opportunity to rebuild 5,500 square feet in the first floor for a teen-centered, uh, new media center and they built it around a lot of our findings from the digital use study where they built a social space that young people were allowed to hang out, uh, bring food, play rock band, uh, and, but they were also able to connect with mentors and areas of expertise, take workshops and really pursue geeked out interests. Uh, there was debate initially about whether they should move their teen stack into the space. They did. Uh, the librarians were thrilled that the circulation of the teen collection went up tenfold after the center opened. Uh, so this has been really fun. You walk into the space and you get the model right away. Uh, Katie Salen's Quest to Learn Schools, there's two open right now, middle schools, one in New York, one in Chicago, uh, school, middle schools based on a game-based pedagogy where all of the curriculum and state standards were organized um, around these quests where things like fractions and writing are uh, are learned in a need-to-know basis while kids try to go through a fantasy narrative of like getting troggles off the island. By the way, you have to understand buoyancy and fractions and things like that. So games, not in literally electronic games, but a game-based pedagogy, meeting kids where they are, trying to start there and connect to academic subjects. And then a little experiment that I'm involved in more on the technology side. So like there's this feeling I have that for every learner, there is a teacher and an expert that can help them. And the internet should be able to help with that problem. So we're trying to do an experiment of um, matching uh, coaches, teachers, mentors, an area of interest with kids um, and see if those sorts of relationships uh, could really help fuel kids' learning and expertise development. And it's amazing, there's obviously obvious reasons why this is a thorny area. Um, 
you know, introducing kids to strangers on the internet isn't going to win a lot of popularity contests and some of the rhetoric around this stuff. But when you really look at, you know, the issues of safety, what really has a transformative influence on young people's learning in an area of interest, being able to connect with a young person or a grown up who's a real authentic hobbyist and expert in an area that a kid is passionate about is really, really transformative. And the internet is a lot safer than real life relationships in a lot of ways um, in terms of people being able to interact with each other around these sort of specialties. So that's just an area we're starting to experiment in. I'm sure, I know a lot of you are, are aware of our work with the Mozilla Foundation and their open badging infrastructure. So again, this idea that we need an infrastructure, new kinds of institutional configurations that enable that informal learning to become more consequential for the formal sector is badging um, and alternative credentialing some sort of mechanism in order to help that happen. Okay, so those are just some examples of uh, the efforts we're making in trying to uh, really take that recognition that it's not just the technology, but it's a specific social context and infrastructures and institutional uh, innovations that are necessary for technology to have a positive transformative effect in education. Here's just some of the sites where we're trying to uh, build community to share some of our learning on the research side.